Illinois University, and I have worked there for 16 years. Um, I've been doing this uh, customer service and healthcare thing for 12 years, and um, you know, very pleased that you all has asked me to come down here. Um, good news is, is that I am a tremendously uh, short attention span. So you can guess that I'm not going to waste your time with uh, anything boring. So uh, if I were you, though, I would probably try to face uh, this way because you're going to be awful tired going like this over a long period of time. Um, if you need to get up to the bathroom, you need to go someplace, that's, that's fine. Um, please don't be shy. If you <laughs> Like that? <laughs> it happens, it happens. Um, I am, since you all decided to sit so far away, uh, I am 50% deaf, uh, especially with women's voices in public places I have a lot of trouble with. So if, if you talk back there, I'm gonna, you're going to have to speak up so I can understand you. Um, let me see. What do I do for a living? I, I run two uh, student services departments at the university. I've worked in uh, five or six. I currently run uh, the municipal transit system in our city, and I also run the university bookstore in, in our uh, at our fine university. Um, my degrees are in a bunch of hodgepodge of stuff. Nothing to do with healthcare, though. They're, I'm in political science, secondary social studies, business, finance, uh, and uh, my PhD is in management. So, um, big fun for you today is that um, the, the, what we're going to talk about here directly impacts every one of your jobs every day. When you leave here today, hopefully that you get to take one or two things with you that you can apply tomorrow. Because most people think that um, everything that we're going to talk about today is above their head or it costs too much money or you can't uh, implement it. But the truth is, is that everything that we're going to talk about today is something you can do tomorrow. It doesn't cost you anything. And I, I to it around your hospital and I read some things on the wall and I can already tell you that you're doing a lot of what we're talking about here today. So some of this might be confirmation that you're moving in the right direction. Um, this, is, this is downstate Illinois. You have some challenges to face in terms of surviving as a healthcare provider. And we're going to talk about that because everybody in here's jobs are affected by what we're going to talk about today. Please feel free at any time to speak up. This is not a a um, me talking at you type of thing. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask you to participate at several opportunities. Okay, so our American economy has shifted, and I don't have to tell you this, we used to be a primary sector economy. That means we used to develop things, we used to actually build things, we manufactured things in our country. Until the last 20 years, uh, that was primarily, you know, we were agricultural and manufacturing. We're not that way anymore. What have, we, what have we become? What has our country become in terms of an economy? Two things. What have we become? We're no longer primary. We're no longer manufacturing things. That's not our primary deal here. What do we do in the United States? What kind of economy are we? Um, in debt. In debt. <laughs> Secondary, no. Yeah. Well, actually, it is called secondary, but what, what are those things inside of that? Service industry. Service industry, yes, that's one. And the other is? Well, healthcare, I, I will argue very quickly, is in the, in the service industry, but the other one is information. Oh, yeah. right, so we're an information economy or a service economy. Well, there's some people outside the door. Oh. Come in. Okay. There's another one. Come in, come in. Yep. We'll find room. That's okay. right. Thank you. There's one here and one over here. No, that was oh, that one's got the computer. That's right. There's a couple over there. No, no, sorry. Glad you're here. In front of the class. <laughs> okay, so we were talking about how our economy has shifted from being a primary economy to a secondary economy, meaning that we are now focused on service and information. We used to actually build things, now, now we don't. And this is global. Why has that happened? Well, it's happened pretty obviously for one major reason. 
um, it costs companies so much more money to use our workers to build things than it does to send it overseas and have somebody work for 14 cents an hour to build it elsewhere. So all that stuff gets outsourced and our economy is built on other things now. Now there's still manufacturing going on. There's still lots of agriculture going on. As I was reminded as I drove uh, here today, there's lots of that going to continue, but that's not our primary area. Do I have proof? Yeah, sure I do. <laughs> Take a look at, um, this is the labor force by occupation. Okay, so um, what you're looking at here is the blue areas are where the service industry is. The blue areas. The green areas are where they're actually building, the, building things and manufacturing things in the purple areas up, up here as well. All right, so you can see that things have changed. Um, we are a primarily a service industry area. We are no longer primary in nature. That's proof. From a book, every one of the 20 fastest growing occupations as listed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics is in the service sector. Mm. Every one of the 20, 20th fastest growing occupations. All the 15 million jobs that have been created since November of 1982 mm. have been in the service sector. All of them. Either, and there, I think they're probably um, considering information to be service sector as well within this, this guy's definition. And that's kind of scary. I mean, I'm 42 and I can remember a time not that long ago where none of this existed. I mean, no such thing as a computer when I was a kid. There was no such thing as a cordless phone and a, a microwave oven. There, I mean, you, <coughs> a cellular phone, the internet. None of that existed. And now we are in a culture that is dominated by those things. Does it scare anybody else here? <laughs> yeah, it should. Just you? Nobody else? <laughs> no wonder you brought me here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when we think of customer, well, A, healthcare is customer service. Period. End of story. Exclamation we, point. Exclamation point. And, and actually, I'm, a, I'm a great to speak about this because uh, higher ed, experiences the same type of difficulties in getting the concept of customer service across to the people who work there and I think actually healthcare might be ahead of us because we have a lot of professors who like to think what do you mean the students are customers they're not customers they're going to take it how we want to give it to them when we want to give it to them what we're going to give to them and healthcare has some of those same challenges where we say you're going to do what we tell you to do, how we to take this bill, do this, and this is how it's going to be, and go away. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a little news flash for you. <laughs> Customer service doesn't work that way anymore. And I can tell by the way you're laughing, you already know that. That's a good thing. <laughs> All right, so when you think of customer, we think of, hear those words, why is there such dissonance? Why do professors worry and, and doctors worry about that term customer service. Well, generally it's because when we see a, something like that, a sign like that, where do you see it? Where do you see something like that? Do you have a sign like that in your hospital? It says customer service. No, you see that Kohl's. You see it at Walmart. Walmart, right? They have a big sign up there. Customer service, returns, gift cards, money services, people who don't know anything. Oh, yeah. it's all right there. <laughs> they care about something, I'm still trying to figure out what it is. That's what it says. They made a big deal out of moving customer service into a place in the store where you can't miss it. Great big sign. Well, it's another thing that changed. I worked in retail in the, in the early 80s, and back then the customer service desk wasn't in the front of the store. Where was it? It was in the back of the store. What was with it? Bathroom. Restroom. Restroom. What else? <laughs> Layaway, that's exactly right. You used to have the layaway back there with it. And they moved, somehow it got moved to the front of the store. Why did that happen? Was it, did they want you to think, hey, we're your great customer service, we want you, first thing you walk in, look, customer service, we'll help you. Is that why that happened? Nope. Why did that happen? Any idea? Why do you think that moved from the back to the front? Made them look good. <laughs> Inadvertently, what? For convenience. Actually, not for your convenience. See, one of the things that changed in the late 70s that Walmart changed the entire complexion of everything was because of their return policy. What was different from Walmart than anybody else was what? 
What was different? What changed? What did Walmart do that nobody else had done before? With satisfaction guaranteed, and you could return anything. You could return anything, and you could return it without without a receipt. Without a receipt. Can't now, but you could. No, you can return it without yeah, a receipt now. You, can. you still can. There, <laughs> they are, were the first major retailer to do that. Well, that kind of changed the game in terms of customer service desk because if the if the desk is in the back of the store and you can return without a receipt. Didn't take long to, for people to figure out you could walk to the store, pick things up, and go return it in the back of the store without a receipt. <laughs> so they had to move the customer service desk to the front of the store for loss prevention. That was the real reason. It had nothing to do with being more proactive in terms of customer service. And yet, it's up in your video, and you think now, customer service, big box, Walmart, Hy-Vee, Kmart, because it's right up there in the front of the store. But that's not what it's about. And it is not the only place that we get customer service. We waited 30 minutes, no service, <laughs> in ketchup and, and mustard. We get it in lots of places. What are other places that you might encounter customer service? Well, uh, McDonald's. Okay, that might be a McDonald's, a restaurant. What else? Where else? Um. We try for it here. Good, yeah. good. Good uh, hospital. Where else? Lots of places. Office. What? Doctor's office. Yes. Where else? Uh, oil change places or car repair places. Okay, good. Car repair. Where else? Airlines. Hmm. DMV. You get customer service at DMV? Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, here we do. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. They have a monopoly, right? So lots of places you go to Chicago, you go to the DMV, you might get really bad customer service. But you do get service of some type, one way or another. You might go to a travel agent, you might go to an insurance agent, you might go to I mean, every place that has some type of transaction does have service. Every place, every place. Bar none. Church. Customer service. Customer service is not just, we get that word customer in our head and we get stuck on the idea of, here's my one dollar, give me my service. Mm -hmm. It is not always just a fiduciary transaction. Customer service can be simply just a transaction between two people. You came into the room and you had to come up, up here, Darla, had to come up here and sit and you said, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm sorry. Well, then you were actually giving me customer service because even though it wasn't rude, you wanted to be, you wanted to make sure I didn't think you were being rude. That was good customer service. Good for you. That was, and as director of human resources. But the truth is, is that we all give each other customer service at all times, and that word just sticks in our head like, you know, I'm not going to the store to get peanuts. You know, I'm here to get health care, or I'm here to get insurance, or I'm here to get educated. At school, teachers give students customer service, don't they? Don't they really? My son is you know, six years old. He is a, a, a kindergartner. And he will regularly come home and tell me, Mrs. Nudd said X. Mrs. Nudd said Y. Do you like Mrs. Nudd? Yes, I do. Well, good. He, he's receiving good customer service from his teacher. We just have to not be allergic to that term. Okay, so trying to just immerse you in that term. Right? Healthcare is all about customer service. We're going to talk lots about that. Okay, so who are your customers? Your customers, who are they? Who are they? Patients. Patients, good, good. I'm glad you said that first. I'm going to actually write on the board here if this works. <laughs> All right, patients. Who else? Basically, anybody who you provide a service for. Okay, be more. That's good, but be more specific. Other employees. Okay, Other that's employees. excellent. Employee, yeah. Other employees. Insurance. Good insurance. Who else? Doctors. Good. Nurses. All right, so let's just say all staff. Mm -hmm. Okay, who else? Vendors. Vendors, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's a sneaky one there. Vendors are sneaky. You, you know, I'm asking, who do we, who are our customers? And you said vendors. Most people think that we are their customers. Mm -mm. 
right? We buy stuff from the vendors. They come to sell us stuff, right? Pharmaceutical people, what do you mean we're their customers? Well, I'm going to prove to you why that's true, but that is absolutely true. And they're one of the sneakiest ones up there. Sneaky, sneaky. <coughs> Who else? Who else? There's, there's a huge, a couple of huge groups you're missing here. Volunteers, yes, yes. Volunteers are interesting because they choose to come. They have no fiduciary reason to be here. Right? They choose to come here and hang out and, and be part of this, right? Electric company. Uh, utilities? utilities? Sure, sure. What's that? No, utilities. You're missing a big group, all right? So let's say you bring a family for the patients. Yeah! Gigantic, maybe even bigger than the patients, because mm -hmm. if the patient's unresponsive, what are the families like? If the patient's in crisis, what's the family like? In crisis too. Oh, probably maybe even more. They might even be more difficult to deal with than the patient themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So their level of intrusiveness, their level of need, far greater, mm -hmm. maybe than than the patient themselves. So they're they're very important. Okay, are, is your hospital um, funded uh, through any taxes, local taxes? Yeah. It is? Okay, so then you do have another constituency, and that's your taxpayers, who may never walk in the door. Right? For those particular people, they may never actually come here, but they do pay for your uh, upkeep. What's their expectation of you? I mean, a family, a patient, their expectation of you is much higher, right? I mean, you're, fix me. I'm, I'm sick. I'm broken. Fix me. But somebody who never walks in the door, they're your customer, but what's their expectation? That you spend their money right. Okay, good. That's excellent. They don't want to see something in the paper where the CEO is absconded off with a half a million dollars, right? <laughs> That'd be a problem. What else is a, is a big deal to them? Would board members fall under? Yes, that? no, no, that's a separate group and that's very good. Mm. Board members. Because and, they have expectations. Yeah, and what, what are, board members kind of fall under the same idea. What, uh, all of these people who are kind of external agents who don't really receive the services that are going on, but they have, you know, okay, financial management, very big one. There's another big one. There's another big one. They may never walk through the door, but they drive by the place a lot. Perception? Yeah, it's everything. It's, it, it, you might think that's minor. It's everything. And I'm going to prove to you why in a little bit. But the way the place looks when you go by, or even if you happen to come in. Now, I've been here once. I'll be here again tomorrow. And I will never forget the way this place looks ever, for the rest of the time that I'm ever in Illinois. I will never forget. And if anybody ever asks me again, what kind of hospital, and I've been lots of hospitals do this, and I can tell you, you know, where you rank in terms of other uh, hospitals your size that I've been in in the state. And it's good. Here's the good news. It's good. You have a pretty hospital. Mm -hmm. Does that matter to anybody? Yes. Yeah, no, it matters huge. It's gigantic. Because what does it tell somebody who comes in the door? You care. Yeah. If what it's else clean, does it tell? Um, yeah. It tells them you care, but it tells them something else. We're proud. We take care of the hospital, so we'll be good to the patients. Yes, yes. And you know what you're doing. Okay, the place looks good. Must be, must be managed well. This, the subliminal message is huge. All right, so yes, that's good. That's excellent. You guys are on board. All right, we're going to get back to the vendors. So what's the product? What's the product? We talked about Walmart. Okay, you go to, you go to Walmart. If I go to Walmart and I go in and buy, I'll tell you a story. When, on Thanksgiving Day a couple of years ago, I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I, I went out to Walmart and I stood in a you know, huge line of people and I, they put you around these um, saran wrapped. I wanted a TV and I had to go stand outside the TV that I wanted for 5 o'clock when they're going to cut it open and then everybody jumps in, give me that! And then, and then <laughs> I got my TV. Right, so I went out there and I'm waiting and waiting around all these people and I don't know what the big deal is with the dust busters, but I mean like the, these the people are buying like five and six tick bags at a time. And and I'm going, what is what is going on here? But I'm gonna get that TV. Alright, so I'm up at three o'clock, I'm fighting people, there's people elbowing each other for the little 
flash drives and I mean it's just craziness. I finally I get my TV, I'm pretty excited, I go up to the front and I gotta wait 20 minutes to check out at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm going, this is 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm waiting 20 minutes to check out with this TV. So I finally get home, I'm exhausted, don't even have enough energy to put up the television, but I do um, look and, oh it's a pretty box, and I'm really excited. <laughs> so I go to sleep and I wake up later and put up the TV, and I, I, I have never forgotten the arduous amount of stuff I had to do to get to that television, but I have a TV. I have the TV, so when somebody comes into my house, I go, look at that TV! And I paid X dollars for it. I got a great deal on it. I don't tell them about getting up at 3 o'clock and fighting Emma, who wanted the stick back for, for that television. But I, I have a thing. I have a TV. That's my product. Now, somebody comes to your hospital, and they come in, and, and, and let me tell you another story. In 2003, I was burned in an explosion. 30% of my body, second and third degree. My whole face, both arms, and my right leg. Only reason I lived is because for some reason I held my breath. I don't know why I held my breath, but I did, and it, it saved my lungs. Anyway, I was charbroiled, and my whole face had melted off. And uh, long story short, get to the hospital. Well, first I go inside, I'm by myself. I go inside, turn on the water as cold as I could get it, and I stood there for 10 minutes, and I let the water try to cool off my skin because I knew I was still cooking. And then I looked in the mirror and I realized my face was pretty much gone. And I thought, I better get to the hospital. This is not good. And I realized I had about five minutes before I went into shock and that 911 wasn't going to get there fast enough. So I got in the car and I drove myself to the hospital. I get to the hospital and I, I get in the door and they take one look at me and they start screaming at me. And I'm not talking about screaming like, you're in danger, I have to take care of you screaming. This is the kind of screaming like, um, you did something wrong and we really don't like you. And they are screaming at me, but at, at that point I started going into shock and I really convulsed. Uh, I couldn't barely speak. And eventually my wife got there and was like, you know, will you back off of him? Because they're screaming at me like, lay down! Shut up! I mean, this kind of stuff, and I'm going, holy cow! I mean, I still remember it to this day. Any idea why they did that? Any idea why they yelled at me? Why they were mean at me? Why I they thought were you were in methane. Correct, Amundo. That is exactly what it was, because they were methane burns. Mm -hmm. It was a, a big grass pile that I went to burn, and it exploded, methane explosion, and they thought I was a meth head. Mm -hmm. So they treated me with great disdain until they sent the cop to my house and realized that it wasn't that. And then they kind of reeled it in. And they were sending me to the burn unit in Springfield. But I remember that. Okay, You can tell that I've healed pretty well. The artificial skin worked real well. But do I remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what was the product? Terrible service. Yeah, the product, I don't have anything... I mean, I can still show them the zero form uh, art artificial skin packets if you really want to see it. Is that my product? I mean, I have a TV. No. <laughs> Here's, I don't have a product. The product is service. Okay? And when you don't have a product to apologize for, you know, listen, I can talk about the funny thing I had to do to get that television, but I still have a TV. All right? But if I don't have a thing, then the product is the service. And when you don't have a thing to apologize for it, the service is all that's remembered. And you will go back to that. <clears throat> well, I had no choice. It was critical care. Right? I mean, it was get to the nearest hospital or die type of thing. But well, you're right. Uh, will that stick in your head? Yeah, will stick in your head. <laughs> Think about going back to the second time. But no matter what you went there for, whether you were a meth head or not, you shouldn't have been... You'd like to think that. You'd like to think that. I would like to think that. But we'll give them a little bit of room on, on that part. And I simply say, you know, um, now here I am, a member of this community, and how many times did they think I may have told that story? Okay. This is somebody who doesn't understand what the product is. Okay. This is somebody who thinks that the product is what I'm going to give you. Here's the gauze that's put, you know, put this on your face. We're going to pour this. That's the product in their head. Mm -hmm. It's not really the product. 
the person who's laying there wants the product to be the service. Mm -hmm. Now, they put me in the ambulance. It was a 90-minute ride to Springfield. And, the, and they had loaded me so full of morphine by that point. That's good stuff, by the way. <laughs> wow. I mean, I was, I was in orbit. And I was just, na -na 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 -na, and I don't even know what I was talking about. But that woman in the ambulance listened, and she was kind and compassionate and just as sweet as could be. And she didn't have to deliver one bit, not one bit of uh, medical service. All she did was keep me comfortable and let me ramble in the, at the mouth. All right, and so about three or four months later, we were in a Walmart. My wife said to me, um, there's the woman that was in the ambulance. And I was like, where, where? Because I couldn't remember her. And that woman right there, she was the woman that took you to Springfield. And I was very emotional in going up and talking to her and thanking her. And I was really kind of embarrassed because I knew I had my <laughs> own. And, and yet, I... I felt great uh, obligation to her, you know, debt, you mm -hmm. were so nice to me. She hadn't done the first thing for me medically, but what was the product? She listened. She listened. That's all, that's all it was. And, and so what did I feel? All right, she, the extension was, oh, she knows what she's doing. She knows what she's doing. Because I, at the end of the day, the product for me was fulfilled. This is the disconnect, where we get into the disconnect, where we think we're delivering you what the product is, but you don't realize it. And what I'm telling you is, in rural hospitals, yeah. if you don't deliver the service, you are not going to exist, because it's not critical care that will make you survive. It's elective care. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that more. <coughs> we talked about, what do, what do we remember? Customer service is not the what. Right, if I ask you um, to remember a good or a bad customer service situation that you've ever been in in the last 10 years of your life, I can guarantee you everybody here in 30 seconds would come up with something, and about 75% of you would think of something bad, and because you're such enlightened individuals, 25% of you would think of something really good. And I would bet if I really pressed it, we could, you know, and I asked, we would have people in this room that would remember things that were 20 and 30 years ago. And it might be, somebody was rude to me at a Walmart, or this person, we were at a, a rest stop, and, or at a, a truck stop, and we're getting, trying to get something to eat, and somebody was really nasty. When did that happen? 1966. <laughs> Is it really about the food? Is it really about not being able to return the toaster? Is it really about the what? No, it has nothing to do with the what. It's how we feel. Okay, when we're aggrieved, we want to tell everybody, and we never forget it. We want to tell anybody because it's our only way to get it out. So when we're aggrieved, somebody makes us feel aggrieved, we're going to let everybody else know. Customer service isn't the what, it's how it feels. It's completely how it feels. So how has healthcare changed? Well, there's been a huge, and there, we're still changing really fast. In the 50s and 40s, how many people had health insurance? Well, they didn't even hear about it. It didn't even really come about until the late 40s. Uh, insurance, not insurance, now that's the entire conversation. The, now, are we going to be insured? Are you not insured? What kind of care are you going to get? What kind of cover? What kind of network? You know, it, it's a constant conversation. <coughs> so many choices in healthcare now. In the 50s, what did you have? Go to your doctor. What, what kind of doctor is it? It's a doctor, doctor. And, you know, the guy with the white coat. Doctor. Well, now we have 87 specialties, right? And subspecialties within the specialties. Geriatrics, and then underneath there, there's oncology, geriatric oncology, and I mean, just subspecialties within the subspecialties. Now, that can be a good thing, but it creates choices, lots of choices for the consumer. And they're no longer the end payer. A lot of them are no longer the end payer. Most people are not the end payer. The person receiving the uh, health care is not the person paying, ultimately, for the care. Right, and that changes the equation some, too. Very similar to higher ed, by the way. All right, so what was the hospital of 1950 like? Not that anybody in here would remember, right? Mm -hmm. 
Nurses wore white. Oh yes. And they they wore their hats and their pins from the school they graduated from. And if you were in the room one minute past the end of uh, visiting time, what happened? You got kicked out. Like yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was their way or the highway. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the what? I mean, did it look as inviting as this? Did you have colors like you know these nice earth tones and things in hospitals? What what did you have? It was white and sterile as it could be, right? Mm -hmm. It was just an entirely different paradigm. What were doctor-patient relationships like then as compared to now? I think doctors, you know, made house calls back then. Sure. Because I can remember getting penicillin <coughs> shots at home. Sure. Um, they were, um, the, they, but the patients, I think, put the doctors more up on the pedestal. Well, why would that have been? Why would that have been? Let's, I'm glad you said that. Because you what? didn't have as many to choose from back then. Sure, that's one good reason. What else? There's oh, some generational. The only one you knew. Sure, there are also some generational things. That particular generation. Uh, More respect for an elder. Yes, that, that generation is characterized by that. So yes, that's one of the things. But there's some other things going on there as well. How many people had high school educations at, at that time? Mm -mm. Was it as many as now? How many of them had college educations? It was nowhere near as many as were. How many of people, even regardless of their education, had that much access to information about their health care? Now everybody who comes in the door says, well, here's the 14 pages that I printed off of uh, WebMD, and I think I have upside-down disease. You better check me. Right? So I mean, the doctors back then were unchecked authority, are right, now no longer unchecked authority. That's not going away. For those of you playing at home keeping score, that's so not going away. This current generation of people, uh, they're called Generation Y, or uh, Millennials. This particular group, they're the most demanding, most technologically savvy, most uh, knowledgeable uh, in American history. And they're very young right now. So they have not gotten into where they're getting a lot of health care. But they're coming, and you better be ready for them because they're going to change everything. Of, we, we're already getting it. We get it in higher ed because that's what they're asking now. They're, they're in higher ed. They're uh, receiving uh, college education. And we've gotten the full brunt of what this generation is like. You have not yet. They will vote with their feet. Um, if they don't want, and this is where it gets into the rural uh, hospitals. Do you have the... Um, phenomena where people around here say, you know, uh, I need to have some type of cancer treatment. So, you know, I think there's something wrong with me. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to Mayo. I'm going to go to St. Louis. I'm going to go to, wh what's the big place that they all talk about here? Where's the, where, where's the big hospital they want to go to? Okay, so the, is that what you hear? I mean, people say, don't, don't go, you know, to local. Go, go to the big hospital. For some reason, the people in the big hospital must know what they're doing. Right? They, they will vote with their feet. Right? So how do you get them? How do you get them to choose your hospital? Right? You've got to ch get them to choose your hospital because you will not survive on critical care. You will not survive on simply delivering what people need only when they have no choice. You must survive on getting people to choose you for when I came in the door, I heard people, I heard this woman talking on the phone and she said, um, my mother was having a procedure done today and we came to the hospital to get it done. And I thought to myself, she's telling that person on the phone that they've made a choice to do that procedure here. Now, we don't know why. It might have been distance. It might have been that she's had good experiences. But she's made a choice to have that procedure done here. She could have it done anywhere. I don't care what network you're in or what coverages you have, you can choose not to have something done here. Um, that's good news. You have people choosing to come here. You want people to choose to come here. And we talked a little bit about millennials. All right, let's go back to the vendors. The vendors are sneaky, very sneaky. Why are vendors sneaky? Because we think that they're delivering stuff to us. Okay, so the Merck, um, pharmaceutical rep comes in 
Bring, hi, how are you? Nice to see you today. Oh, how's everything? How's the kids? Yeah, good to see you. How's it? Here's the stuff. Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you, goodbye. And you think, okay, they delivered the stuff, we pay the bill, end of, end of transaction. Wrong. What if that Merck person lives within 15, 20 miles of here, and somebody uh, in their family around here says, you know, I need, um, I need to get some outpatient, um, I need to get some lab work done, and I need to get some rehab done. I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to go to over there to Clay County and <coughs> get that done. And what's the next thing out of that person's mouth? Based on what? Based on what? Are, do they work here? Are they are they healthcare professionals? Do they know anything about the delivery of what you're giving them? No. Word of mouth too. Very good. All very good. All right. Listen. These people don't know the first thing. Could be a Coke salesman. Could be a Coke delivery. Are you Coke or Pepsi in this hospital? Pepsi. Okay. It could be a Pepsi delivery person. They come in the door, they deliver the Pepsi, but when they leave, they leave with the perception. Okay, when they leave with that perception, they're going to tell other people, and will other people listen? Mm -hmm. Why do they listen? I mean, for, I mean, these are... Impartial people. They're impartial, but they're not knowledgeable, so why do we listen? You're absolutely right. They're impartial, only to the based on, based on what other people's experiences based on their own experience with the health care no maybe not just the facility just how you interacted with them just a hi hello how are you doing will someone listen to that will their family listen to that absolutely they will why because familiarity breeds credibility let me let me prove this to you you go down the road, <coughs> you're driving down the road someplace. You haven't had anything to eat. You're in a place that you don't know anybody. Where do you stop to find out where to eat? Gas station. Gas station. Now, you don't know that the guy at the gas station just finished a nice plate of pork brains and white gravy. <laughs> but you asked him where to go to eat, and you probably followed the instruction. Why? Be well, because he has culinary, he's a you know culinary critic? Cri mm -hmm. No? He knows no? the town. He knows the town. Familiarity breeds credibility. He's familiar with it, or she's familiar with it, and so therefore we say, look, it's just too much for us. I'm just going to trust this person. They must know. That's where I'm going to go. Do we do that with them? I mean, that's a really basic thing. What was the risk? Might have had a bad meal. Might have had some pork brains. But people do this with you know, physicians, lawyers, really tough choices. Why do we do that? Because it's just too much for us to put our head around. Right? I, I don't want to know whether you are board certified in cardiothoracic surgery. I just want to know whether you fixed Aunt Emma. Right? So if Aunt Emma tells me it's good, it's all good. It's just too much. Right? So lawyers, do we go into the book and just go, mm, that one? No. We listen to somebody else and we say, hey, do you know a good lawyer? Yeah, I know a good lawyer. It's such and so and so and such and so. Same thing, customer service and healthcare is based in the same thing. All right, so people make choices based upon what other people will tell them, even though those other people don't know a thing. They don't know anything about what you actually do. They, they don't know anything about the delivery of healthcare, the actual medication, the treatment, none of it. They know only one thing. How were they treated? What did it look like? How did they feel? Not the what. How did they feel? That's really powerful. Okay, if you leave here with only one thing, this would be one of the things I would hope you would leave with today. You are, in this case, Clay County Hospital. You are this hospital. Period, and no further than that. And we deal, I deal with this every day in our transit system. But I'm going to use a couple of examples here. Who has flown and had their luggage lost before? Anybody? Yeah. What airline was it? DWA. Oh, for out of St. Louis? All right, so this is a long time ago. Yep. Okay, this is, this is going to kill two birds with one stone. Great. There, all right, so how long ago was this? Twenty-some uh, years ago. Okay, and you still remember having your <laughs> luggage lost. Okay. Did you get it back? 
Yeah, about four months later. <laughs> four months later. Okay. Now, how many people do you figure from the time that you, where were you going? Do you remember? I was going to Philly. Okay. Do you, uh, how many people do you figure from the time that you dropped off your luggage to the time that you actually got it back four months later? How many people in TWA do you think that you actually came in contact with? Quite a few, probably, because it went to every airplane ran on the thing. Let's be generous and say it's probably 20, 25 people. Between the ticket agent, the baggage handler, even the crew on the flight that you were on, let's say it's 20 to 25. How many people did TW actually employ? A bunch. Thousands. Tens of thousands. All right, Delta <laughs> employs 60,000 people. 60,000. Yet, you come in contact with maybe 20. And and face to face, you probably only come in contact with three or four. And yet, when I asked you um, who lost your luggage, you didn't say, uh, let's see, it was Darla and Jude and Bill and Jackie. You said TWA. TWA. Because the public doesn't make a distinguishment between the four people that you came in contact with and the organization they represent. So when you talk to those people and they tried to make it right or you know, got it four months later. All you heard, well, you don't remember any of those people's names, do you? you? And nor would I expect you to. All, all I re you remember is, that was TWA, right? That is exactly what happens to your hospital every single day. You come in contact with somebody from the outside of this hospital, they come in here, they X, Y, or Z, and they have a good experience, you represent the entire hospital. And if they come in here and have a bad experience, you represent the entire hospital. Period. End of story. Uh, I, I broke this <coughs> finger um, when I was playing football. I was 32 at the time, and I broke it pretty good. And I had to have eight weeks of occupational therapy to get to be able to bend it like that again. And they cranked on and cranked on. I don't remember any of those people's name, but I remember what a great job they did. You know, in getting me in every day, and they were nice to me, and I remember all of that. I don't remember any of those people except I remember that physical therapy place, that physical therapy group were great people. That's all I remember. And so anytime anybody's asked me, see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. all right, so every single person who's there on a daily basis, good, bad, or indifferent, you are making an impression with those people who you come in contact with. All of those people. Now here's the really scary part. In a small town, if you can be recognized even when you're not, at working, you still represent the hospital. If they know you work here, and let's just pick on Darla some more since she's late. <laughs> if you can be recognized, let's say you go out to um, what's a local bar, real dive. Is there a dive? Okay. So you go out to this bar and you start clearing tables and screaming and yelling and jumping up and down, and people see you there doing that, will that word get out on the street? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How fast? How fast? This fast? Cell phone. Then you can get out. Yeah, yeah. Now, will that, could that affect you? Could that affect Oh, yeah. And could that affect the hospital? Absolutely. Yeah. See, that's, I call it the priest in the bar theory. Because if you see a priest, let's say a priest in a strip club there, you see, you're like, what are you doing in here? Well, you don't belong in here. You don't, this doesn't, this doesn't yeah. equate. All right, so if you have a problem, you do something out of line, I get, you know, if I'm in, out with my family and I go raise a ruckus, am I going to hear about that at work? Yeah, probably pretty quickly. Because I represent the university. Because I'm visible. All right, so if you're visible and people can recognize you, it does carry over. In a small town, it carries over. And, here to tell you, as scary as that sounds, your livelihood counts on it. All right? Especially, 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 I'm going to let you off the hook now, especially clinical people. Mm -hmm. People who actually deliver the health care themselves. Mm -hmm. Those people are so in a fishbowl. Mm -hmm. So. All right, so think about it for a second. Have you heard, you know, this doctor, even, even if it wasn't as dramatic, uh, you know, this doctor's kind of rude outside of this, and, you know, th this person, you would really don't want to mess with them. And, I mean, they all have their own reputation even outside of work, don't they? Mm -hmm. All right, and that carries over back here. So, you have, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling, but it's absolutely true that every single day when somebody comes in that door, 
you have an opportunity. It's an opportunity. And it's the only easy way to think of it. Because if you think of it as every day I'm being watched, and if I do one thing wrong, that's just overwhelming. But if you think of it as an opportunity, and you just embrace the opportunity once or twice a day to make a difference for one person that you see, just one thing, one thing, one, one extra little thing, will you remember it? Think about your own world. Think about your own experience. Would you remember it? One little thing. What makes you stand out? Let me tell the excellent radio story. It's a great story. All right, so I'm a big Yankee fan because I was born in northern New York. All right, so I raised in northern New York, and so I'm a big Yankee fan. And my son is actually named after a Yankee. And so, I mean, it's a big deal to me. And I have XM Radio because I can listen to New York Yankees baseball anywhere, anytime. You, you really can't get this away from me. Well, my wife has an XM Radio as well, and her XM Radio broke. And she decided she didn't want to listen to it anymore anyway. So I called XM and I asked them to do some switching and whatever and, and also to cancel her radio because she didn't want to listen to it anymore. Of course, I still do, but she doesn't. This is in October of 2009. So I pay quarterly, so I didn't pay any attention. So a couple of quarters go by, actually it was a year, and I get a bill and it, I'm still being charged for two radios. So I call them and I said, well, look, Gary, here's the deal. I, a, I, I, actually, I emailed them first. I emailed them and I said, okay, look, uh, I canceled this radio a year ago. Actually, I want to use, uh, I want to switch the radios. One's broken, one's not. I want to put that active one on mine, make it all go. Thanks for playing. I get the email back. It says, Mr. Kai, well, first of all, we show both of these radios to be currently active. One of them is not canceled. And secondly, you never canceled uh, uh, the other one anyway, so don't even go there. So like, an, I send back a little terser message, and I say something to the effect of Dear XM Radio. Um, I'm here with the radio in my hand, and it is not working. All right? So i clearly not active. Secondly, uh, I did call and have that canceled. Maybe it was. I didn't know the exact date at the time, but I did have it canceled. Um, I get another email back that says, Mr. Kai, uh, our records show that that is a active radio. All right, so A, stop talking about that radio, and B, you're not getting a refund. Thank you, XM. All right, so now I'm angry. I'm really mad because A, I know this radio doesn't work, and B, I know that I canceled that one radio a year ago. So I call XM Radio and I tell them, I want to cancel my radios. Now, if you think I'm angry, I have to be. Being a Yankee fan, living in Illinois, and the only way I can listen on the radio is XM Radio. I'm so angry, I'm going to cancel my subscription. And I said to the lady, I'd like to cancel. She said, is there a reason? I said, no, I just want to cancel. Because I don't want to get into it. I don't want to hear it. And she says to me, uh, is there anything I can do to keep your business? And I, that just struck me odd, and I thought, okay, you're asking for it, let me give it to you. <laughs> so I tell her what the deal is, that these people, you know, basically told me I was a liar, and that I did not appreciate that, and that I had canceled the service, I just wanted to switch them, I wanted to use this other one, blah, blah. So she says, just one moment, click, 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 click. She goes, well, funny, Mr. Kai, I sure right here that you canceled your service in October of 2009. Mm -hmm. Like, wait a minute. Those other people didn't have access to that same screen? They couldn't see that I had canceled that service? Well, just one minute, sir. Click, she goes away. She comes back, she goes, sir, I really need to apologize to you here. Um, you did cancel your service in October of 2009, so we're going to issue you a credit for whatever it was, a hundred and some odd dollars. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we also show that that other one isn't active, and you know, just tell us what the idea is and then we'll switch them across. And she, she did. She made it all right. And then at the end, uh, she says, is there anything else I can do? I said, no, I want to, I want to tell you something. I said, and I explained to her that I was a huge Yankee fan and that I was ready to throw it completely out the window because of what had happened. That she had saved her, her company that business and me going and telling everybody and their cousin how poorly. Now, you think about those first two people who had dealt with me. And not only had they gotten it wrong, but they were impudent about it. You know, they were telling me, no, you're a liar. No, I'm telling you, you're a liar. And you, you didn't write us for this refund, and we're not going to give you one. And then eventually we find out that not only had I done everything I had said, but um, the radio wasn't active either. 
Uh, well, that was a watershed moment for them because I was about ready to go XM radio, but in the end, somebody was able to do damage control. So here's the good news for you. Every day, you're not going to come to work and have a good day. Some days, you're going to come to work and have a bad day. And you're going to do things that are not good customer service. You can still do damage control. There can still be somebody who rescues that transaction from the four-month TWA, I didn't get my uh, luggage 26 years later pile. All right, you do not want people running around town with a 26-year-old story of bad customer service. And how many people have they told in the interim? You look like you have a story. <laughs> how many people have they told in the interim? How many? What do you do when you get bad customer service? How many people did you tell that story to? Oh, and why do people do that? Why do they do that? Why do, do they? Why do people tell the story? Because it makes you feel better. You're venting. You you were aggrieved, and it's your only way to get even. That's yes. In a town this size, and you go to Walmart, you're still doing damage control. Because people will stop you in yes. Walmart that recognize you from what you do here or at the clinic. And they will let you have it. I mean, they will tell you what went wrong. And they'll tell you good things, too. <clears throat> don't get me wrong on that. But they, you're still doing damage control in the community. And you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you know who I would really hate to be? I would hate to be a credit card company operator. Uh, that would be a job that I would not like. I would not like it for a couple of reasons. One is obvious, when people are calling you, it's probably not for a good thing. But secondly is, when they call, everybody's got a story. All right, and they want to tell that whole story. All right, and it's going to be a 15 minute extravaganza of how Aunt Darla once bought a doll for Cousin Bess and it didn't work out and then I, my right leg hurt and I can't pay the bill and, and they're going to pay da, 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 da. Do you get this here? Mm -hmm. Do you get this here? Do you get people that need to tell you their story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to listen to their story. I hate to tell you that, <laughs> but you have to listen to their story. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about being compassionate. Why? Because you are selling service. You're selling service. I hate to tell you, you're not selling health care. You're selling service. You're selling the same thing I am. In, in, in transit, in, at, at uh, the university, we're selling the same thing. Service. And we hate hearing that word selling, that we're selling. I got a little news flash for you. Selling simply means I give you X, you give me Y, there's some type of transaction. That's all it is. Do you do that? Yes. All right, good show, bad show. Uh, di who's been to Disney? Any Disney property? Ever, ever. Raise your hand, keep it raised. Not very many. Keep it raised if you've been to any Disney property. If you've, on any one of those properties, if you've ever seen Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Goofy, any one of the characters, keep your hand raised. All right, look around. What do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe. If any one of you have ever seen one of those characters take off their head, keep your hand raised. You've seen them take off their head? Well, I'm back. Ah, you were in the back. All right. <laughs> Sneaky snake. Uh, you will never see somebody out front take off the head. Why? It ruins the perception or what the is, image. What's Disney called? Disney has a name for it. Wonder One. Uh, magic. magic. Mm -hmm. It's magic. Disney magic. See, they don't want, you know, when a kid goes into Disney World and they see Mickey Mouse and they go running up to Mickey Mouse, Mickey, Mickey! I mean, they've seen him on TV, they've seen him in the cartoons. I mean, it's big time for them. I mean, their heart palpitates. I was nine when I moved down there and I moved to Orlando and I can remember going, I was so excited. I almost had peed my pants. I was so excited. <laughs> now, you walk, up to, you walk up to Mickey Mouse and... You, this, for that six-year-old, seven-year-old, this is Mickey Mouse. And Mickey takes off his head and goes, hey, kid, get away from me. <laughs> what would the kid do? What would it do to the kid? Cry ruin his soul. They'd freak out. They would completely freak out. It would ruin, it would ruin the entire vacation. You can't take off your head, all right? It's symbolic, really. Disney uh, has this idea of magic. 
their their employees are not employees they're cast members mm -hmm. they don't wear uniforms they wear costumes. costumes they don't call human resources human resources they call it casting mm -hmm. they call it casting right everything that they do is based upon this model of magic right? they they want what are they selling are they selling frozen bananas and rides? No. What? I'm selling entertainment. No. They're selling. They're selling. A, uh, for them, they call it magic. They mm -hmm. they want you to feel a certain way when you're there when you leave. They have an incredibly strict uh, dress code at Disney. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how strict it is, and everybody holds everybody else to it. Certain kind of belt. Certain kind of color. Until 10 years ago, you could only have one color of hair. And, you know, women now will put two or three different shades. One color, and you'd be gone. Certain length of earrings, certain types of um, necklaces. Men can only have a certain number of rings, women too. Your shoes had to be shine, can only be certain kinds of shoes. You could only have a certain type of belt, certain length of hair. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Why do they do that? Their yes, but what is what are they really doing? Okay, who do they draw? Millions and millions of people from all over the world. So what do they have to do? They have to try not to offend anyone. anyone. All right, so they try to be as vanilla as is physically possible. I want to keep everything right in the center. Good show and bad show is what Disney calls their analysis of what's going on around them. All right, so if they're, this is something you can do uh, every day. Go ahead. When you have a staff meeting and you have people who uh, talk to each other about, hey, I saw, are, are you a nurse? Who's a nurse? Somebody a nurse? You're a nurse? Uh, what kind of nurse? I think nurse. Here? Yeah. All right, so, when do you have do you have staff meetings? Mm -hmm. All right. If somebody were to be a, a way Disney would do it is, is this good show bad show. Somebody sees you do something extra for somebody else outside of what you would normally do. Uh, you help somebody into a car, waited a little longer, <coughs> talked to them in the car, uh, gave them your phone number, whatever. You went above and beyond. Okay. You didn't do just what your your job description says. You did something. A little different, a little extra. That would be what Disney would call a good show. All right, when somebody else sees it, they report it. Good show. That's a great show. And when we do something like lose somebody's luggage, and we, you know, we 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 have in the bus system. I'll tell you, a bus system bad show. Five months after we started the the bus system, we had somebody in the back of the bus who was call, uh, ringing the passenger response. Ding, ding. They're just supposed to ring it once, and you know, stop at the next thing. Get off. Somebody in the back didn't like the fact that our drivers were switching, and while they were switching, they were talking a little too long. Hearing, so somebody in the back of the bus started ringing the ding, 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 like four or five times. And the driver, rather than turn around and easily say, I'm sorry, we'll get going in a second, turned around and said, we're not moving till I find out who's ringing that bell. <laughs> That's a true story. And the person next to the person who actually did said, what are you going to do, kick me off? And boom, he kicked the guy off the bus. I got five calls in about three minutes. You know, you know what's going on here? That's a tremendously bad show. About uh, six months ago, we had a driver who got fed up with some secondary school students who were riding the bus and he hit the brakes to get their attention. That was a major error. And, uh, threw somebody on the ground, uh, they ended up getting hurt, and blah, blah, the driver ended up losing his job out of that one. I mean, but he should, he could knock somebody's teeth out. That's a bad show. Now how many people do you think ended up finding out about such a thing? Got it, everybody. Right, so that's an image thing. We can't have that image. We can't have people thinking that our drivers are going to be jacking on brakes and people are, you can't, can't have that. All right, so that's a bad show. But good shows and bad shows are not just about people. It can also be about facility. So like I walk in your hospital and it's immediately welcoming. And I look on the wall and it tells me about your mission and your vision and you've got this poster up about your latest uh, 
results about uh, how people in the surveys have said you're doing. And I walk down this hallway and it's kind of an interesting design with this uh, yeah. fan and out thing. There, and I get to the end of that hallway and it's really pretty nursing station. Really, really nice looking. Almost kind of looks like a service center. Like a, uh, it, it's really quite nice. Didn't it, it didn't immediately say to me nurses station, but then I realized how big can this hospital be? It's got to be a nurses station. <laughs> but it's nice. It's pretty. I look at these uh, admissions areas. They're clean. The floor is clean. The colors are nice. The light is inviting. Those are all good shows, right? What? One thing do you think is on every single person's job description at Disney? Every person. To keep the place clean? Pick Absolutely up. correct. Pick up garbage. That is number one on everybody's thing. Why? And it should be yours as well. And maybe even more important here than Disney. Why? In a hospital, what does garbage tell people? Dirty. Dirty. Dirty? Germs. Yeah. And that tell, dirty tells them what? No fiction. Yeah. So no you care. What else? Dirty, unkempt tells them there's germs around. We're overwhelmed. We don't know what we're doing. We the service care. isn't good here. We don't care what it looks like. It tells them all of that. Hospital, it's huge. Why do people wear white coats? Ever thought about that? You work in a hospital. You must know. Why do they? Why was it? White, nurses white, white coats white. What is that all about? It absolutely does. It's a mental message. Okay, so what are the five good shows for hospitals? Competence. All right, in, in a hospital like this, you are, one of the things you're selling is competence. You want people around you to know that you have people here who know what they're doing. All right, so. If I get sick, I have something go wrong with me, and I have to choose a hospital to go to, you want them to go, they have people there who know how to treat this. They have people there who know what they're doing. Your hospital must take the time. Who's in marketing here? Anybody? Do you have people? They just walked out. <laughs> oh, you tell her. You've got to tell people in town regularly the people that you have here, what they can do. They think these are your friends and neighbors. They don't realize that these people are trained people. Trained. You're a registered pharmacist. That is not easy. I have a, I have a former girlfriend who teaches pharmacy at a, a college in New York. It is really hard. I know how hard that is. People don't think anything of it. Give me my pills. Right? That's what they think. <laughs> they, they don't realize how difficult it is. It's up to the hospital, and, and not just pharmacy, but in every healthcare field. It's up to the hospital to sell that. You need to let people know you have competent people here. You have people who are trained at God knows where to come, and who chose to come back here and practice their craft. That is huge. Because a lot of times people don't realize that their friends and neighbors are so skilled. They just think, that's Darla. <laughs> that skills can't cheat me. <laughs> Cleanliness. Cleanliness is huge. We talked about this art, and I'm picking on you. you know. <laughs> we talked about cleanliness. We talked about how important that is. Compassion. Okay, you are selling compassion. Think back to my burn unit fandango. Compassion is maybe one of the most important things because sometimes you're going to tell people things they don't want to hear here or something's going to happen here that people aren't going to like. Right? Being compassionate is all they really need, all they really want. There's nobody in this room that doesn't think, at some point I'm, not going to, I'm never going to get sick and I'm never going to die. Everybody's going to get sick, everybody's going to die. But that doesn't mean it's not traumatic. It is. And you are the purveyors of that. Think about that for a second. I can tell you um, that the people who worked in hospice with my grandparents were like gods to my family. Why? Did they do anything curative? No. They were compassionate. All right. So you might not be able to 
cure sickness, you may not be able to treat it as well. You may not be able to give them the stuff, but you can be compassionate. And is that part of this? Is that part of what? It is, it's probably a huge part of what's going on here. We always have called it something with doctors. What is it? Doctors have a name. We have a name for this. Bedside doctor. manner. Bedside manner. Bedside manner. And, and unfortunately for some doctors, it's kind of gone <laughs> south. <laughs> but I have to tell you that there, I don't know if you have a hospitalist here <clears throat> now, but things are changing back in the other direction because as they become uh, career people b belonging to the hospital, the hospital then regains the ability to say, hey, look, um, you know, we need you to work on X or Y. Compassion is huge. It's not just a matter of take this, do this, sit down, I'm Gregory House, MD, and I'm going to insult you. <laughs> right? So that, that's not what it is. Communication. All right. Everybody, by the way, does anybody need to sign the attendance thing? They may not. Or why was she standing the whole time? Okay. She don't want to come up here and sit because she's seen the business I'm giving Darla. <laughs> Um, all right, so you go to the doctor and you have something wrong with you and you don't know what it is. And you, you know it's not good, but you don't know exactly what it is. Do you want the doctor to go, well, I'm not sure we can really tell you, or, you know, uh, or do you want clear, concise communication? Or give it to me straight, guy. Right? It's all we want. It's all they want. Clear communication. Tell me what's going on. When you go into a patient's room to deliver care, do you just go in and give it to them? What do you do? Go in, you introduce yourself and talk to them and explain to them what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then when you're done? Thank them and just, you know, listen to see what questions they have. And if you, you're forgetting one real big thing when you leave, is there anything else I can do? For yeah, you? because if you don't say, is there anything else you can do, then you walk out and go, eh, I'm cold. Eh, I gotta go to the bathroom. Eh, I want some jelly. Right? Alright, so you gotta put it back in their in, in their court to let them terminate that. Alright, confidence building. Okay, this is huge in small town. Huge. You must build the confidence of the customers that you are trying to draw such that they will come here by choice. So when they have a place to choose, they will come here. You must build that confidence. You do that with those other four C's. Building confidence is a daily endeavor here. Uh, do you have a local newspaper? What's it Two. called? Two. Two? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what, what are they called? The Advocate Press. And the Hometown Journal. Okay. Are, are they uh, newspapers? Is one of them kind of a shopping No, team? they're both newspapers. They're both are newspapers? Mm -hmm. Well, I will guarantee you that those newspapers are starved for local generated news. Mm -hmm. Starved. And if your hospital will put out press releases, they will print them. I, I take advantage of this all the time in, uh, back in Macomb. I must put out three or four press releases about uh, transit every month. Who knows what it's about? Could be anything. But we're always doing it. Why? A, it's free. B, when it's in a newspaper, people see it, they think it's true, it's news. And C, I can't, that's free exposure. Free exposure. Everybody sees that stuff in the newspaper. They all see it. They say it, everybody will say it's a rag, but everybody sees it. All right, so you need to use that to your advantage. Confidence building is, you know, I like to see small hospitals talk about the skills that the people there have. Because a lot of times we just take that for granted. I love seeing that. And I think the people in town take it for granted. But I don't think it's the only thing you could do. I think a lot of times um, small hospitals need to create a niche for themselves. We're really good at X. Do you have that here? What's, your, what's the one thing you're really good at? Or two things? If you don't have an immediate answer to that, you should. Because if you don't have an immediate answer to it, do the people in town? That's the thing. There should be an immediate answer. Let me give you a, uh, let me give you an um, example. Western Illinois University, we have about 
12, 13,000 students. And people say, well, what, what kind of school is that? Where are you, what, what are the big majors there? Well, immediately, people will say, law enforcement. We have 2,300 law enforcement majors at Western. Big time law enforcement school. Well, what else? Business, education. Immediately, we've got three uh, things right off the top. There's 50 majors, but we, are, we know law enforcement, business, education. See what I'm saying? There should be something that comes along with what goes, what goes if, if you don't define it for them, they'll define it for you. Yeah. All right, so you need to tell them what you do well. What do you do well? What do you, what do you want them to know you for? Okay, you must have a culture of service. And this means that we have to analyze what we do daily. We have to, we have to look at ourselves, look at each other, look at our departments. What are we doing? Or how are we delivering this service? Because if you don't, they will. They're going to anyway. They're going to define every transaction that they come in contact with you as good or bad. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed. So you take that as a gift. When someone complains, it's a gift. It's a gift because they're telling you, I care enough to tell you what you didn't do right. Make it better. That's huge. How do, how do we identify customer service? All right, well, I've kind of gone around the corner with this, so I'm, I'm going to uh, abbreviate this section. The stuff that you give is um, the health care itself, but it's not what, what they'll be able to identify. Okay, so you think about an Oreo cookie. The Oreo cookie is an Oreo cookie because of what? The inside. The inside, which is known as the stuff. The stuff. And they don't just have regular stuff, they have double, double stuff. stuff. Everybody loves Oreos. How many people here have had have Oreos in their house right now? <laughs> yeah, dude. those hands kind of went like this. <laughs> people buy Oreos and they're the number one cookie in the world because of the stuff. Hydrox can't duplicate it. You can't get the Walmart brand and get the same kind of Oreo. Everybody loves Oreos worldwide. And you can't go to the store and buy a gallon of stuff. Can I have a gallon of stuff and a spoon, please? No, you can't go to the store and buy stuff. You can't go to the store and buy the wafers, just the wafers. Although I saw that now they have uh, their uh, fudge card. You get a fudge card. But you can't just go buy a whole case of wafers. Can I have a case of those wafers, please, and a gallon of stuff? I'm going to make my own. You can't do that. You can only buy an Oreo as an Oreo, period. And if I show you the stuff and I held it up, you'd go, what is that? I, I can't tell what that is. Is it a mothball? Is it a cheese? Is it, it Play-Doh? What is that? But when I put it in the context of the cookie, and I show you the cookie, oh, that's an Oreo, and it's got double stuff. And that's why I love that, uh, that's why I love that cookie. All right, so what's, what's my point here? There are parts of service. We kind of just went over them uh, in your case. Nobody goes to a restaurant. You go to a restaurant. I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> Sorry, what's your name? Sure, you go to a restaurant and you go in. What's your favorite restaurant? It doesn't have to be here. Olive Garden. Mine too. I got engaged at Olive Garden. Um, <laughs> are you laughing because I shouldn't have done it? <laughs> Since you laughed, I'll tell you a quick story. So my wife is, is very uh, assertive. And so we're sitting in front of the kitchen door that night, and you know how they come out and people sing the birthday thing, and mm -hmm. so she, you know, she's like, God, these people won't stop singing, and they're singing and singing and more singing. So I had gotten up at some time during the meal, and I'd gone over to the guy, and I said, look, I'm going to ask her to marry me, and you think you could have those people come out and, and sing? So <laughs> she's right in front of the kitchen. So the kitchen door opens up, and uh, they're standing right behind her, like, and the head of the head of the She goes, who the hell are they singing for now? <laughs> that would be you. <laughs> you really want to marry me? That's a true story. All right, so uh, you go into Olive Garden, and you're with a group of people, and you're gonna, you, night, you know what you're going to eat, and it's going to be good. Do you like, uh, what kind of wine do you drink there? I'll drink wine. So what do you drink when you're there? Iced tea. Strawberry daiquiri. Okay, strawberry daiquiri. <laughs> strawberry daiquiri. All right, so you've got this thing in your mind about what it's going to be like, and it smells good, and it looks good in there, and you, they're going to go seat you, and they're very nice to you. You go in, you sit down, they give you your menu, 
oh, what am I going to have? I'm going to have the full soup and salad, all you can eat, or am I going to have the, you know what you're going to order, you have a nice meal, they keep refilling your drinks, you're having a nice time, the food is good, it's hot, it's on time, everything's good, you get up at the end of the meal, you can go to the bathroom, come back, sit down, they come back to the table, fill your drinks again, you're having a good time, and then you get to the end of the meal, you've had a great meal, everything has tasted good, they've done everything right, and you're waiting. To pay and you're waiting and you're waiting and now you get mad do you get mad? Mm -hmm. if they don't bring you your bill you're gonna get up and leave to... I probably wouldn't <laughs> but my husband would would he get mad? yeah he would he get mad mm -hmm. now wait a minute you came for the food you came for the strawberry daiquiri you came for the nice atmosphere they're just not bringing you the check on time and now you're gonna get mad well, you came for this stuff which is the stuff but Something's, something's wrong here. Okay, they've greeted you, you waited an appropriate amount of time, you got sat, you got your food, everything came, you, the, you drinks, everything, everything's good, but they didn't bring you the bill, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're mad about it. Well, why are you mad about it? You're mad because you cannot identify service as just stuff. It's not just the food, it's not just the daiquiri, it's the entire experience. Okay, so if you don't have the whole thing, it's not an Oreo. If you don't have both ends and the stuff, it's not an Oreo. It's just stuff. It's just wafers. In healthcare, it's no different. If you go into somebody's room and you introduce yourself and you tell them what you're going to do and you're really nicely dressed and everything's in the sun's out that day and you, you, do you do phlebotomy? All right, all right so you, you hit the vein on the first time and everybody's happy and you know, it's all nice and clean and all that business, and then you just get up and leave the room, that could be bad. Now you've done everything to that point. The stuff was done correctly, but all the parts weren't there. Customer service is all the parts. It's not just the daiquiri. It's not just, what do you like to eat there? Uh, fettuccine Alfredo. Okay, it's not just the fettuccine Alfredo. It's the bill. Believe it or not, it's the bill. It's the way it's delivered, when it's delivered, when they come back and bring you the little mints, right? The, the little cream to mint things they bring you. If they don't do that, you're like, hey, 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 where is it, right? <laughs> the parts of service. These are the parts of your service. Every transaction that you have, every customer service transaction you have, has these parts of service in it. Who are you? Hey, Jessica's wearing, she tells me who she is. She's the manager of rehab services. Okay, so I know who she is immediately. That, that's a great reason to wear a name tag because mm -hmm. it tells people immediately. I make every one of my drivers wear a name tag with a picture on it. Is it because they're going to get blown up in Macomb, Illinois? No. It's a customer service thing. Totally customer service thing. All right, so that's introduction. So immediately I'm saying, you want to know who I am? Here I am. That's a big thing. All right, now, you, again, you're delivering the stuff. The stuff is your health care. The stuff is what you know. The stuff is what you learned, all those exams you took. That's the stuff. But that's not what they're, that is not going to get them to identify it as customer service. Pharmacists, nobody knows what the stuff is. They know you're going to give me the pills. You might give me some, uh, you might give me some advice. Uh, let's try this. All right, so are you familiar with the drug called Lamictal? All right, and, and, and Lamictal, do you know, what, what generally, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what generally is Lamictal used for, do you know? Thank you for anticonvulsants. Absolutely. Now, Lamictal is not a super, super common drug. And I just put him on the spot, and he came up with it like that, like that. Now, it's a fairly, it would be a fairly dangerous drug, Ken. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, what you didn't know, what nobody in this room knew, is that I just recently had to take this drug for six months for an off-label usage. All right, and it scared me to death because uh, I, uh, the amount that I had to take was half of the, low, of the normal amount. Now, I'm going to really put you on the spot. Do you know what the normal amount is? What the, what the average therapeutic dose would be? Well, I've seen it bring from 25 to 200 milligrams. Yeah. Now, see, this is one drug out of how many? Hundreds and hundreds. And we're having a conversation about this drug right here right now. That is what the stuff is right there. That's the stuff. That's what you need to let people here know 
you can do. Now, your next door neighbor has no idea you know that kind of stuff about Lamotri. <laughs> <laughs> See what I'm saying? There's a bridge to be crossed in a small town. You need to put those pieces together to make people realize, all right, when people come up to you, they might ask you questions about all kinds of things, don't mm -hmm. they, as a pharmacist? Right. And they want an answer from you, right? They, all of that training, all of that time, right? And it might come down to, what's this bump on my wrist? <laughs> See what I'm saying? The parts of service are every bit as important as the stuff. Every bit is important. Don't get caught up in the idea that just because I know what I'm doing, shut up and take it. Don't get caught up in that because the people are going to make the choice and they're going to make the choice based on how you treat them, what you, how it's delivered, not what's delivered. Okay, we talked about the restaurant service. Talked about that. Can a hospital stay feel like a welcoming situation? Can it? Tell the shift changes. No. <laughs> yeah. My wife's had two children. And the first time she was 12 days late. Second time, seven days late. In both cases, they had to induce labor. And uh, in both cases, it was protracted. 25, 26 hours, mm -hmm. some ridiculousness like that. Yeah. Um, Where's my epidural? You know, that, that kind of thing. I was like, please, please get rid of epidural. <laughs> but you know what? Those, those obstetrics nurses were amazing. Calm. Uh, when they shift changed, they all knew the Kaya woman's in there. <laughs> they knew how to deal with her. They knew how to deal with me. You know, when the babies were born, they were, you know, I can't tell you how good those people were. I was stunned by how good they were, how cohesive that they were. Mm -hmm. That same hospital where they give me the meth treatment. <laughs> so I'm going to give their props where they did really well. You know, their OBGYN area, not really the most fashion forward, and I've seen a lot of hospitals with much nicer, mm -hmm. but I can't tell you how good a job they did with my wife and those two little children uh, when they were born. My daughter, uh, my wife was in a 50 mile an hour head on collision when my daughter was eight, when she was eight and a half months pregnant with my daughter. And by a miracle, my daughter was head down, and um, 24 hours later, she had flipped, and it saved her life because it, it cracked my wife's breastbone, but my daughter's head was underneath there. And it saved her life, and then she somehow flipped back and was born normally five or six months or, or weeks later. And the doctors had told us, um, you know, that child may be born, they thought she was dead. And then mm -hmm. uh, and they said, look, when she's born, we don't know if she's gonna have you know, brain damage or whatever. Well, she's brain damaged, sorry. But she's, she's, <laughs> she's totally normal, but she's crazy. <laughs> when she was born, I was like, counting fingers, toes, is she breathing, is she blinking, what's going on? Total miracle, and the doctors and the nurses there handled it like it was no issue. My son was born wrapped in his umbilical cord. I was three times when I was born. Well, he didn't think anything of it. Put back in, put it over, put it back out, make sure that there is. It wasn't like we're drinking some drinking some juice. He didn't think anything of it. And I thought to myself, he knows what he's doing. On one of those doctor shows, a guy came in with a big uh, limb, tree branch, Impaled. through his, in, yeah, in his neck. And the emergency room doctor said to the cameras, what you don't understand is I'm going to go back in there and act like this happens all the time. Yep. And that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Nobody wants it to be their first time. Mm -hmm. We want to think that the people who are delivering this service to us do this all the time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a, can it feel like a welcoming situation? Yeah, it can feel like a welcoming situation even if it's catastrophic. Even if your wife and your daughter might be dying right there. And, I, and I've just been yelled at a few years before about being burnt up. But I had confidence because when my son was born, I saw how confident they were. And so in this situation, I was like, they're going to take care of this. It never went through my mind that it wasn't going to be okay. Because they, they handled the professional. Gigantic. 
how can healthcare professionals make patients feel valued, empowered, and like customers? How can you? How can you make patients feel valued? Listen to them. Mm -hmm. That you're interested in. Good. That's huge. That's, that's in everywhere in customer service. You think about it. When somebody says, Joanne, thanks for coming today. We hope you come back again. You get excited. Like, wow. They, oh, you're back at Olive Garden again, huh? There's them drinky drinkies. Now, one time I, when I was 18 years old, I was a night manager at a 7-Eleven. Uh, 11 at night to 7 in the morning. Okay, so this is a tough shift. I worked at 5 at night till 10 o'clock at a toy store and then 11 o'clock till 7 a.m. at 7-Eleven. And around 5 o'clock in the morning, the people would start, this was the third largest 7-Eleven in Orlando. All right, mm -hmm. so I mean, it's busy. And people would start coming in at 5 o'clock in the morning to get their stuff. And I recognized that these same people were coming in every day. And when they would come in, I, I would see them coming in, i think, can I get, I knew what they get, like this one uh, couple, they would come in, and this is back with glass bottles. 16 ounce bottle of Tab, 16 ounce bottle of Mountain Dew. And I'd run back to the cooler and I'd grab them and I'd sit them on the shelf and I'd see if I could get them before they'd come in the door. Because then they come in the door and they'd say, ha, ah, your drinks are right here. Do you think that made them feel special? Mm -hmm. Right, 7-Eleven, that's all it was. I got, it was making $4.25 an hour. But these people, you know, can, some loyalty can be created. They were like, I am never not going to go there, right? I remember Bill Day would come in and he would get his coffee. It would be three sugars, one cream. I make sure that boom. As soon as I say boom, three sugars, one cream. Here it is. Right? Why? Making people feel special. That's huge. Little things like that. Little things. Uh, I'm going to tell you a healthcare story about specials, and it, it's important to hear this. Okay, you guys start to think I'm falling apart at the seams, but in October of 2000, I had to have my right shoulder reconstructed, and uh, it was to be done at Methodist Hospital in Peoria. So they told me to show up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, that's an hour and a half from where I live. All right, so uh, we could not go. We're not going to get up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning to go over there. So we go over and spend the night over there before we check in in the morning. Well, I'm used to in any healthcare situation. When you go to check in, you figure, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes before they're going to come and get you, right? So I go up. And, uh, Jude Kaya to be cut on this morning at 6 o'clock. So I go to sit down. I swear to God, I'm, Jude Kaya, please. I mean, I, I, I hadn't sat down in that chair. I didn't get to, the, I didn't get to read anything. Like, Come on, you're going back. Wow, immediately I was like, well, you you mean 6 o'clock. All right, so they take me back into the back. Uh, I need you to change out of this, change into this gown. This is October the 13th of 2000. All right, so... Um, it's later, later in the year, starting to get cold. Uh, I get changed into the gown. I'm sitting there, and the lady comes and she goes, I bet you you're cold. Uh, just a second. So she goes and she gets some warmed blankets for me. Now, they weren't real. I don't know if they were like blankets you have at home, but they're like white. You know what they are. You must know what they are. And they were warmed, and she put them on my leg. I thought, well, that's kind of nice. And she said, you know, we, you'll be here for a few minutes before I take you into to the um, operating room. Would you like to read the paper? Well, that's awful nice. It, it's uh, during the World Series, big Yankee fan. Yes, I want to read the paper. So she brings me the newspaper. I'm sitting there reading the newspaper with my blanket on, I'm all ready to go. I'm thinking, this is great. So a few minutes later, she comes in. She says, um, all right, we're going to take you into the thing. Now it's going to be very cold in there. She says, 54 degrees in this operating room. I'm like, OK. <laughs> so I, I go into this operating room, still wide awake. She lays me up on the table. It is cold in there. And uh, they immediately take this big bag, and it's like over my whole body, and they fill it full of hot air over my body. I was like, well, this is great. And she goes, we're going to warm you right up. So, yeah, uh, they immediately filled this thing up, and I was warm. And then the doctor came into the room, and he, he uh, came over. He said, uh, Mr. Kaya, I'm Dr. whatever his name was. Um, I'm, we're going to take care of you this morning. Uh, if you wake up in the recovery room, that means it wasn't that serious. If you wake up in a, in a regular room, it's going to be a, a much more serious procedure. You all ready? Yep. Okay, 10 seconds later, I'm out. Long story short, they fixed up my shoulder really good. Now, I've had that problem for 16 years, and this guy fixed it. 
Is that what I just talked about three or four minutes about? Was it about the fact that miracle that you fixed my shoulder? No, the care. No, it was the care. All right, so then when it was all over with, the rehab people call over and say, well, you're going to be, they didn't know I'd come from a comb. You're going to be, we're going to schedule you for rehab. Um, well, that's an hour and a half away. You think I can do rehab? Absolutely. What's the local rehab place? We'll call over there. We'll transfer the things. We'll make sure it's they did, then a couple weeks later, we're just calling to uh, see how you're doing. Is everything going all right? Do you need to come back? Is, how's everything going? What was the care like for you? I mean, they were so, so, they hold my hand. And to this day, 11 years later, what do I remember? Do I remember that I can do this because I couldn't do this? No. I remember they were awesome to me. I can remember the newspaper. I can remember exactly when they brought me in. That's what I remember. What made me feel valued? What made me feel empowered? They made me took care of. They took care of you. you. They made you number one. They were top five. Yes. All right. So that made me feel valued. What made me feel empowered? They told me what they were going to do to me mm -hmm. before they did it. All right. I knew what was coming. If you wake up here, it's X. If you wake up Y, it was the recovery room, by the way. <laughs> you had to shave off some bone and stuff. But, uh, so it was the good news for me. And then, you know, they even when I woke up and I'm, ah, 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 they still treated me nicely. <laughs> even though I was crazy on that um, anesthetic. Making people feel empowered is communication. It's letting them know what's coming. It's letting them know what's next. It's letting them know what their options are. That's empower. Like customers. Okay, I'm going to go briefly through this because we don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. This is something you can take with you and you can use tomorrow. And, and I want you to think about this because it will change the way you think about anything you do, uh, anything you're involved with. But I want you to think about uh, in terms of the hospital. These are the four circles of customer service. Okay. The outside circle is generic service. Simply put, generic service is what you get at any place, anywhere. All right, so any hospital in the world has what? Doctors, nurses, uh, billing, drugs, uh, ER. That's generic to every single hospital. There isn't a hospital without them. The next circle in is expected service. This is a little bit more than generic, but it's not um, special. Expected service. So we expect that there'll be doctors. We expect there will be nurses. We expect there will be wheelchairs. We expect that the billing will be fair and that it will be done expediently. We expect um, that, that uh, you know, they're not going to hurt us worse. We expect maybe a pharmacist. Uh, most hospitals have them. <coughs> we expect good housekeeping. We expect that the emergency room will be open 24 hours a day. Th those are what we expect out of the hospital. So you have generic and expected service. That simply put is what will keep a customer. But it won't get a new customer. You will not get a new customer with expected service or generic service. You get them with these. This is, I did that. There's <laughs> uh, augmented service is when it's really kind of juiced up. So you have not just, um, let's use it, let's think about it in terms of a bank for a second. Banks have, we expect they have checking, but augmented service would be free checking. And instead of, we expect they'll be open from 9 to 5, well, augmented service would be Saturday hours. Right? So that's augmented service. It's this and a little bit more. Right? It's not just what you would normally do. It's kick it up a notch. Right? This is where you start to get special stuff. This is when people start to go, do you know what they did for me? They didn't, they didn't have to do that, but they did X. It was augmented. They're not going to use that term, but that's, that's essentially what you're giving them, special service. We could use that as special service. Um, let's see, you put somebody in the car that you didn't need to, you spent a few extra minutes with them, and you ran back inside because they forgot their umbrella, you brought it back out to them in the rain. That's augmented service. Because what they expected was, you'd come out, put them in the car, go back inside. When you do special things, it's augmented. Uh, a hospital may, it, we, you might have somebody up front who um, 
valet parks cars. Do you do that here? That used to be what we called potential service, but many <coughs> hospitals are doing this now. Mm -hmm. They have uh, a volunteer up front who valet parks the cars at a hospital. Potential service is when you do what I call the pursuit of wow. Things that are crazy. You, what do you mean you're doing that at a hospital? Hospitals don't do that. Think about a bank again for a second. How many, you know banks do um, senior citizen trips, right? What is a bank doing, doing leaf peeping trips for, for senior citizens? What is the connection there? Why do they do that? Yeah, and, and they want them to feel comfortable with the bank. 80% of the wealth in the country is where? With people over the age of 50. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's not stupid for them to get right into uh, their comfortability and provide them services that they want. Right? Potential service for a hospital. What are you going to do that's wow, that's crazy? A lot of times if we have like patients and we put in a semi-private, sometimes they'll stay, sleep, whatever. And like just not too long ago, we had a patient and we'll let them, like if there's a family room, won't stay, they can sleep in another bed. And we tell them in advance, if we need it, we need it. If we don't, it's open, use it. What's their reaction to that? They, they like it. We give them guest trays. You and know, they're very, very coffee, so they feel very good. I guarantee you they go tell people about that. Mm -hmm. I would probably <laughs> consider that to be augmented service. <coughs> it might even be potential because they think that uh, many people think that hospitals are money grubbing. But when you do something like that, that's really compassionate and extra, they're probably quite caught quite off guard by that. Wow, that's really nice. Potential services and augmented service are where you get new customers. It costs one dollar to keep a customer, five dollars to get a new one. You can throw things up on the wall and find out what sticks all day. Your culture must find cool things. Now the funny thing about potential services, one second it's cool and then and everybody else copies it and then it's expected. Think of an ATM. In 1975 there was no such thing and then it was well, I got this card, I can go stick it in a machine, it gives me all money. Isn't that something? That was potential service. Ten years later, now it's not, or twenty years later, it wasn't, uh, do you have an ATM? It's how many ATMs and how much does it cost to use them? It went from being potential service to expected service. When things are cool, they don't stay cool. So you, A, it means you copy everybody else as much as you can, Go and find out what your peers are doing, find out the cool things that they're doing, and do them. Nothing wrong with that. And secondly is, it is not a destination. It's a journey. You don't find out today that I've, I, I have to get this cool thing, we're going to do it, it's going to revolutionize uh, healthcare, and we're going to do it, it's going to be cool, and that's the end of it. No, it's not how it works. you got to keep coming up with cool. Alright, so we've got this We've got this transit system uh, uh, that I run. It's the only fare-free system in Illinois. We thought that was cool, but it's not the end of cool. Then we had to find uh, other cool things to do. So we did real-time GPS. Anybody who has a phone can find <coughs> where any of our buses are in real time for free. That wasn't cool enough, so then we had to continue to find cool things. So we went and uh, put um, text-based real-time scheduling. So you can go up to any one of our bus stop signs, text a number to that, uh, from that sign into your phone, 10 seconds later, the next three buses on every route that come to that sign come to your phone, free of charge. Because it's cool, because it's cool. It's a pursuit of wow. It's not a destination, it's a journey. And it isn't all come from me. You have to go back and tell them. You've got to have people and your culture has got to be welcoming to listening to what can we do different. I guarantee if I went around this room right now, we spent two minutes we could find 10 things that you could say, I've always thought we should do this. If we, just did a, if we just did this, it could be just a little bit different than what you do now. But you all do your jobs every day. I guarantee you, you know how to make them better. It's just a matter of your culture being willing to listen to that. Tell me how to make it better. Okay, let's make it better. Don't be defensive about the fact that you need improvement. You're doing pretty well, but everybody can eat. Everybody can have improvement.
That's the key. You have to want to get here. You gotta to want to live in the red, red zone. That's a football reference. I gotta get go do that better the next time. I like that. All right, the future of customer service in healthcare. All right, it's crazy. New healthcare law. I can tell you right now, if the healthcare law passes as it is right now, it will completely change your business nearly overnight. And really, in one way that I, you might say, well, everybody be covered. That's not the way it's going to change everything. If you know anything about the um, <coughs> PPACA, I think is the official name of it, Obamacare, the biggest change in it is that not only are there no pre-existing conditions anymore, not only are there no caps on care, but the real big change is wellness. Mm -hmm. The new, there are a gazillion, there are like no limits to wellness care. Well, I can tell you in your world, um, those types of tests are where are highly profitable. All right, so those you will see hospitals with wings of wellness care, well baby care, and colonoscopies, and every kind of wellness that you can think of. It is unlimited under Obamacare. Unlimited. For you, that will change your business overnight. Absolutely overnight, because. At the end of the day, you're a business, and you're going to do what it takes to stay afloat. We just talked about the wellness benefits. Um, what's your biggest grocery store here? Walmart. <laughs> I don't know. I An IGA. Okay. Are you familiar? We have a we have a grocery store. Your IGA is a good, probably a good example. IGA is pretty compact, small place. Mm -hmm. Okay, IGAs are real common around the country. It's a, it's a small mom and pop grocery store. <clears throat> when those places decide to get real big, you look at Walmart, you could probably use as an example. They don't add one square foot of grocery space on the floor. We have a grocery store called Hy-Vee. Mm -hmm. And Hy-Vee went from the That's size employee of... employee-owned though, right? Well, doesn't make any difference. Yeah. So they went from the size of IGA to the size of Walmart overnight, but they didn't add one square foot of grocery space. Why? Because there's no money in groceries. The, the profit margin in groceries is one to three percent. Mm -hmm. Eensy, eensy. So where do those stores make money? What do they add? Um, Books, magazines. Okay, what else? Yeah, and clothes. And At grocery stores. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear what you said. Drugs. And Drugs. Huge. Pharmacy, gigantic. Pharmacy. Pharmacy. Health tickets yeah. to people in. Health, yes. Well, health. no, it's a, it's a huge money maker. What else? Health and beauty. Like, um, yes. Kroger's. Or what else? Florists. Deli. Oh, meat. Yeah. Restaurant. Just go around the outside of the store. That's where the money is in a grocery store. It's not in the middle. They want you to buy, go to the deli, to the bakery to the meat, fresh meat, to the, uh, the pharmacy, to the bank, to the florist, all that stuff on the outside, the, to the liquor store, to the, all, that's where the money is in the grocery store, okay? You have a grocery model here as well, all right? Your critical care, the day-to-day, the -day, all that stuff, that's not where they're growing. Where is the money made? It's in all of those elective things on the outside. You, know, you said you worked in um, what kind of care? Clinical. Okay, that's one of those outside things. Those are those are the things that are growing. All right, uh, you go and look at what what uh, departments are growing in healthcare. What are they? What are the things that uh, that you see hospitals adding square footage of? Rehab. Yeah, rehab. Very good. Outpatient services. Mm -hmm. All right, huge amounts of money in those things. Those are elective care. Those are elective care. Those are where people are choosing to come to you. Grocery model. Really, really good for, for uh, health care. Because a lot of times we think it's all about the groceries. It's nothing about the groceries. It's completely about what's around it. And who makes the decisions about care? Well, Lord. We like to think that it's just the, the doctor and the patient. There's a lot of other people involved. 
could be insurance companies, could be family, could be bank, could be who knows. But there's a lot of other people that make decisions about care than the two people that we'd like to have it. And that's changing. I mean, even in this new health care uh, law, who makes the decisions about care will change. 80% of the amount of money that's spent in the United States on health care is spent on people over the age of 60. 80% should give you a clue as to what kinds of care will grow. <coughs> All right, let's go quickly back. I told you that one it wouldn't be born. Was it born? No. 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 All right. Second, I told you that you would take a couple things with you today that you could use tomorrow. One, we talked about who the customers were. Now you know. What's the product? You know what the product is. We talked about the changes in healthcare and that your product, by the way, is intangible. And when you have an intangible product, your product is service. Familiarity breeds credibility. Or just, <coughs> I am, click on the hospital. That, if you take nothing else with you, take that with you. Because every time you come in contact with somebody, look, I can dress like this and walk through this hospital and people are going to think I work here. And if I make two or three contacts with people, I guarantee you they're going to, that guy, nice guy, told me where to go, da, da, da. Just because I look like this. All right, so you need to know that every time you're walking through here, even if you're on a break going between two things, making it one different, just make one difference a day for somebody. Even if it's to just go up and go, hey, welcome, welcome, can I help you? Nothing other than that. If you can do that, it'll make a difference. You are your institution. Good show, bad show? Take a look around, <coughs> walk around, look at your facility for good show and bad show. And pay attention to your peers. When they do good things, get them recognized for it. Let, it. let other people know they did that. Your culture must value those things. They are what make you special. And you want to be special because you want to be chosen. We talked about the five C's. Competence, cleanliness, compassion, communication, confidence building. You can't do one of these without any of the others. You have to do all of these or you will not get people in the door. I know it, I know it seems crass, and that would be the sixty, I guess, to say um, you need to get people in the door. People are always going to be sick. They're always going to need you. But whether or not they choose you matters on this. Do you have a culture of service? Are you a culture of service, or are you a culture of this? Just let me do my thing. You don't want to be that culture. Be invasive. Look at what you do critically and find out what you can do better. How do we identify it? Remember the stuff, the wafers? You, it isn't customer service unless you do all of it. All of it. You can't just give them a wafer. You can't just give them the stuff. You've got to give it to them as a cookie, the whole thing. Even, do you work, Jeff, do you work in maintenance here? Yes. Okay, I, if you come in, uh, room has a problem in it. There's a heating issue in a room or a leak in a room. Are you delivering customer service to that person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, huge, huge. Because if it's if it's terrible, all that there are people going to they could great doctors, great nurses. Uh, food was even good. Everybody loved it, except there was a leak in the bathroom. They couldn't use the bathroom the whole time they were there. What are they going to tell everybody? <laughs> just about the just about the bathroom. So you could be the linchpin in that particular person's time here. The stuff, what they came for was to get fixed, but it's everything else around that that identifies it as service. And everybody is responsible. Everybody. We talked about the parts, the restaurant service, and that a hospital can be a welcoming place. You know, we think of it as an institutional environment, but it doesn't have to be. We are, you can already tell by the way that this hospital is designed and the colors that they used and the lighting that they used that there is an uh, idea within the architects that they want it to look and feel a certain way. Just walk around. It doesn't feel like the hospital of 1950. 
All right, now it's up to you to use what you have. This is very special. You're lucky to have this. I can tell you I've been at some other hospitals in places that are larger than this that are nowhere near as nice as what you have. All right, the four circles, generic, expected, augmented, and potential service. This actually comes from the Harvard Business School. You just went to the Harvard Business School. <laughs> augmented and potential service, that's the pursuit of wow. Find out what's wow and keep trying to find out. It never stops. You, the day you stop is the day you're going backwards. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. Or as they said in the Shawshank Redemption, what did Red say in the Shawshank Redemption? Get busy living, get, get busy dying. Future of customer service in healthcare, I can tell you two things. All these things are going to change. I can also tell you this. People are still going to get sick. People are still going to need you. You are still critically important to this community. Now, it's up to you to decide how important you're going to be. Are you going to be the first aid station? Or are you going to be a provider of choice? Do you have a, do you have a, a, a logo or a, a slogan? It used to be we're here, we're home, we care, and now it's making, working, working together, together to make healthier. a healthier community. What is it? Working together for a healthier community. Okay, um, I think slogans are really powerful because they're what you get exposed to regularly. And like every day in the shower, I hear, um, you know, McDonough District Hospital is uh, providing the, the continuum of care. And I'm like, okay, what, what, are they, what are they trying to tell me? All right, so what is yours again? Working together for a healthier community. Okay, so what are you telling people when you, they hear that 50,000 times? What are you trying to tell them? That we're all in it together, we're working together, purposes. What I would tell you is this. A slogan should not be accidental. And I don't know if yours is or isn't, but I'm telling you that whatever it tells them is what they're going to hear. So if it's cutesy and it doesn't do what you want it to do, you've got a problem. Now I don't know uh, what, what your hospital's mission, how that meets with your mission, but it better. That slogan better. Because that's what they're going to hear over and over and over again. And that's what they're going to think of you as. Very important because again, you're identifying yourself to them. Right? You want them to have some type of identity of you. You want to define yourself. Whatever that is, it should be on purpose. On purpose. Slogans are so powerful because you think, if I, if I stand here and, let's just do this. Um, you deserve a break today. What company was that? Okay, that you deserve a break today was 40 years ago. How long did it take for you to come up with it? Three seconds? Two seconds? Uh, how about this? Um, uh, What's that? What's that? Which one's that? I walk a mile for a camel. Okay, that's that's 40, 50 years old. This is how powerful they are. This is how powerful they are. All right, so that's why I say it has to be really, really uh, intentional. Hmm. Wellness benefits will change the whole game. Put that right in your back pocket because that's coming real shortly. This is 2011 by 2014. If it doesn't get modified. You will be a wellness benefit machine. The grocery model of, of hospitals. Remember that critical care is the groceries. Everything else is where the money is made. Who makes the decisions about care? That's going to change. It's still changing. I hope it stays with the patient and the doctor. What questions do you have? How did you foresee us when you come in the door as professional facilitators? I had, I had two things. One, when I came up from the outside, or when it was just kind of a nondescript um, brick building, and I thought, hmm, okay, it's not a very big town, um, but it was clean, and I liked that your, um, you have your little health care facility after you turn on the road. I wanted to know who the the road is named, who's Melinda Burke? 
Stacy Burke. Stacy Burke. Um, the guy that lives next door by the pond, that was um, his daughter, and I think she was died in a car accident okay. or something, and he owned the land of oh, the okay. hospital. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when it got into the front door, I was immediately uh, struck back because I realized this whole place had been remodeled and redone, and there was um, a volunteer right as I came in the door, and immediately, can I help you? What can I do for you? And I said, where's the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> but no, then I walked around and looked around, and I thought, very clean. Uh, people were very welcoming, uh, smiling, look at you, uh, didn't seem like they were on a rush to go somewhere else. I was really intrigued by this room, because you have these three open spaces. Uh, I thought that was kind of neat. And I thought, okay, this is a hospital that's, and then I read your mission there on the, on the door, and I kind of looked at those things, and I thought, okay, this is a hospital that's a little more advanced than, you know, your normal rural hospital. So I thought, okay, this is good. They're, they're going some places. Of course, the fact that you brought me here shows your advancement. <laughs> no, but I, I think you, I, you would be surprised. I've been in some hospitals where there's 17 different kinds of flora in, in the hospital, and I'm thinking, uh, this isn't good. You know, where they're struggling to that level. You are certainly not, uh, you, you have very modern facilities. That's, that's nice. Questions? Comments? Is it better to have too many people to help you or not enough? <laughs> you mean an individual? It's like you used to go, well, let's go way back. You used to go into a penny store or a Sears store ah, yes. or Walmart, and you would, by the time you had gone into one department, you thought if one more person asked me if they can help me, you know, I'm going to kick them in the shit. Well, and second. now you can't you're, find anybody. You're right. But let, <laughs> let's put that in healthcare for a second. Mm -hmm. I, it annoys me to no end to go into a store and have 14 people say, can I help you, can I help you, can I help you? Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is a loss prevention tool. Did mm -hmm. you know that? Mm -hmm. They're not really wanting to help you. They, they want you to know that, that, that you know they're there. They're there. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what can I help you really means. Um, but and I don't I like. It. I don't want anybody up in my video. I want to take my time and look at itself. But let's put it in healthcare for a second. You go in. You go into a hospital, or you go into a doctor's office, or not, in more of a hospital, and no one says anything to you, and you think to yourself, "Is somebody going to help me here? Somebody going to? Somebody going to come out?" You want people to help you. All right, something that we've done at Western, uh, we have people come through all the time on tours, mm -hmm. all the time. And we we always treated them like they're you know they've got the plague. We can't speak to them. They're on a tour, so we said no, no. If you see those groups, you go up and you introduce. Hi, I'm Jude Kaya. I'm the director of the bookstore. I run the bus system. How are you? Where are you from? Thanks for coming. All right, those people are like this. Holy cow! They, they, these people spoke to us. It's like they're in some little cocoon. Mm -hmm. you actually, broke that thing and spoke to you and welcomed you. Now think about it in terms of a hospital. People come in, uh, you know, you can tell within five seconds if they're lost, if they need something, if they go, why do we not take the time to stop and, and be invasive with yeah. those people? Can I help you? Are you looking for something? Or just, hi, how are you today? Hi, hi, hi. You know, I walked through this hospital and ten people said hello to me. Right? And that was true. I did. I walked through and... and Woman in the back there in the green. What's your name? Mindy. Mindy said hello to me, didn't you? You didn't know I was doing this, did you? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I saw Mindy coming down the hall. Hi, how are you? Hi, hi, how are you? Just being nice, being being friendly. That's that's a big thing in a hospital. Yes, being more invasive is better than not because a hospital is not a lending library. Mm -hmm. People don't walk around. Right? If they are, we either A, from a security perspective, should know why they're walking around, but B, there's a friendliness component to that. What do you have that the big hospitals don't have? You are their friends and neighbors. They trust you. So exploit that. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. And I heard that. I heard some people in here uh, kibitzing back and forth. And I heard them in the hallway. Ah, oh, I heard your mom was up here. Oh, yes, how are you? Okay, I'll see you on Sunday. Oh, you're such a stitch. There I, I, heard, I, I heard all of that going on because this is a community hospital and people like each other, people know each other. So greet each other. Greet each other. Be part of each other. That's what you sell here. You sell that. And it 
it's free to do that. Build the confidence. It's going to save your jobs. It's going to create this hospital's future. Isn't that good news? It's good news because you can control that. You, you can do that. It doesn't take uh, anything special other than not being lazy to do that. That's all it takes. So what do you do with the lazy person uh -huh. that your day? <laughs> Say that again. So if you go it. through all that and everything is just wonderful and then you have the lazy person that kills it all at the end, what do you do with them? Kills it at the end? At the end, you're in trouble. <laughs> now, remember I told you that you can always do damage control. It's never the best, mm -hmm. but you, nobody's going to have perfect days. All right? Not everybody in this room is going to come to work every day and be Mary Poppins and Florence Nightingale. You're not going to be that every day. Someday you're going to be Elvira, and someday you're, some you're going to be Nurse Ratchet. Be, we, we, what we want to do is pick each other up. All right? It's one community. All right, so when your friend's having a bad day, maybe you want to pick up the slack. And when you hear, you know, something end badly, it needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. All right, who's your CEO? Bob Sellers. Okay, is, am I going to get to meet him? All right, if Bob, the morning. If Bob Sellers is on the boat doing this, it starts there. Mm -hmm. It starts there. You need to know whether you have a culture of service. Service isn't perfect. Service will never be perfect. Some of what service is is what we call service recovery, which is what we also call damage control. You're going to make mistakes. The key isn't that. The key is whether we let the mistakes end, whatever. That's the damaging part. The damaging part isn't making them. It's not correcting them. All right, so that starts with somebody who says, we're going to correct them. When we make errors, we're going to, we're going to do better. And when we do good things, we're going to celebrate it. We do that all the time. We have a culture of pins. The drivers like these little lapel pins, and they wear them on their lanyards. Mm -hmm. you, you all have these pull-out things. They wear lanyards. Yeah. All right, so the, their culture is this. When they get driver of the month, they get a pin. Uh, driver of the year, they get a pin. Perfect record, they get a pin. Um, when they do, every once in a while, there's a, a watershed event, and I reward them with pins. So like on one particular day, we had 17 inches of snow, and every single person showed up to work. Even though some of their houses were buried and we had to send out a truck to get them for 15 miles, every single person came to work. And I was moved by that because they showed how much dedication they had to our mission. So I bought everybody a snowflake. And everybody who wears a snow who worked that day got a snowflake. And then this year we had a record setting day on, on uh, Halloween. So everybody got a pumpkin, a jack-o'-lantern that goes on their, on their pin. It's a culture of pins, so now they're all pinned up. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that it shows a, a value. We value certain behaviors. We value, uh, we give that driver of the month. Everybody wants to be driver of the month. So we, we show value. So this good show, bad show, you know, this uh, driver, do you have an employee of the month type mm -hmm. of thing? Right, those types of things, uh, those are important because it shows what the institution values. So when somebody uh, has, experiences a culture of service, does good things, um, you know, she's putting people in cars in the rain with a, out an umbrella, and we, we recognize that, that tells other people, hey, we value this behavior. That's important. And then if your culture is willing to identify the things that you're not doing well, and say, okay, we want to do these better, we need to confront it. What are we doing better? How do we do better? That's when you're on the way. That's when you're on the way. It's when you say this, it doesn't matter. Yeah. That's the damage. That's when you just go, doesn't matter. It does matter, because TWA won right there's remember for 26 <laughs> years about the one person who did X, Y, and Z. And I can tell you what, everybody has a memory like that. Everybody, it's not just a server. Everybody remembers that what, that, hey look, it's been 11 years since I had my shoulder reconstructed. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was burned on September uh, 7th of 2003. I remember it like it was yesterday. Not from the burns, from the way I was treated. And here's the good news. They did some things later that made me feel differently about them than on that day. So you will get some other chances. You will not get infinite chances. And you don't have infinite customers to draw from here. You have a limited number. So if you don't do service, it won't be long before people are going, I don't want to go there. 
I'm on the school board in my community, and we're right now negotiating our health care contract. So the school, uh, the, the faculty came into the room after we worked on this contract, and their first question was, how far away from this hospital can we go? What's in our network? Uh, we don't want to go to this hospital. We want to go somewhere else. All right, well, I don't work for the hospital, but I can tell you if I had, I mean, if I was on that board, I'd be going, whoa! Because what's the message they're sending to every other member of that faculty and everybody? I don't care. I don't care. I'm going, if I've got to go here, I'm going here. That's, well, we're in a town of 20,000. This is what, 5,000? Mm -hmm. right, so you can multiply that times four in terms of the power that those types of things can have. Really powerful. Anybody else? Hey, I've taken up two hours of your time. I hope it moved quickly for you. Mm -hmm. I know that you give up two hours of your time. That's very valuable. It would be for me. So I hope that I gave you that value back. Thanks for having me here. I really enjoyed it. And Good thanks job. for playing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.